Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning, dear friends, and welcome to this module. In the last week, we had looked at how several social movements have brought the issues of sexual harassment and gender discrimination to the forefront. The rise of movements like Me Too and Time's Up with the support of online platforms also saw a rise of misogyny in the form of trolling and death threats by men to feminists on social media. This is in a strong contrast to a large number of men who immensely supported, valued and encouraged the female survivors is speaking out through the Me Too movement. This shows the necessity of a multi-methodological approach which acknowledges the concept of multiple masculinities. That there are multiple definitions and dynamics of masculinity. Such diversity amongst men from unassertive heterosexuals to toxic or dominant or aggressive masculinity highlights the point that understanding how men enact manhood in different ways is central to deciphering gender politics and gender relations. During this week, we shall take up the concept of masculinity in detail by looking at the embedded and embodied plurality of the masculine subject and masculinities as a discourse. We shall begin this discussion by reviewing the 2005 paper of R. W. Cornell and James W. Messerschmitt. The paper is titled as Hegemonic Masculinity rethinking the concept. In this essay, Conan and Messerschmitt explore the idea of multiple masculinities and the concept of hegemony that has influenced the area of men's and masculinities studies since its inception. The authors have traced the origin of the concept in a convergence of ideas in the early 1980s and mapped the ways it was applied when research on men and masculinities expanded. They also suggest reformulations to provide a more contemporary understanding of being a man and becoming one. They also recognize social struggles and present multiple masculinities. Cornell and Mesher Schmidt introduce this essay by accepting the influence which gender studies has inculcated from this concept of hegemonic masculinities. They are also aware of the fact that the concept of hegemonic masculinity has also attracted some serious criticism. They defend and define the primary and underlying concept of masculinity. However, the criticism of trait models of gender and rigid typologies is essential for the deeper understanding of the discourse. Connell and Messerschmitt say that the concept of hegemonic masculinity does not equate to a model of social reproduction and they suggest that there is a need to recognize social struggles in which subordinated masculinities influence dominant forms. Gender is one of the social categories that children learn in today's societies. Adolescents also begin constructing their self-concepts in line with the gender stereotypes they have internalized. Gender identity typologies are related to gender typing, friendships and social and emotional adjustments. 
there are multiple masculinities and we need to discard one dimensional treatment of hierarchy and trait conceptions of gender. Connell and Mesher Schmidt suggest reformulation of the concept accordingly in four major areas. They list these four areas as one, a more complex model of gender hierarchy. Second, they emphasize on the agency of women instead of segregating them. Thirdly, they explicitly recognize the significance and the role of the geography of masculinities. And lastly, they emphasize the interplay among local, regional and global levels. They provide a more specific treatment of embodiment in the context of privilege and power and a stronger emphasis on the dynamics of hegemonic masculinity while recognizing internal contradictions and the possibilities of movement towards gender democracy. They aim to re-examine the concept of hegemonic masculinity and its consequences as it has impacted recent thinking about men, gender, social hierarchy and popular anxieties about men and boys. The issues they have discussed in this essay are crucial in contemporary struggles about power and political leadership. Public and private violence and changes in our understandings of families and sexuality. It was in the reports from a field study of social inequality conducted in Australian high schools that the concept of hegemonic masculinity was first proposed. Connell had commented that the project presented evidence pertaining to multiple hierarchies in gender as well as in terms of class, gender construction and masculinities. This idea and the findings of these reports were further systematized in an article by Kerrigan, Connell and Lee in 1985 and they proposed a model of multiple masculinities and power relations. In turn, this model was integrated into a systematic sociological theory of gender. If we look at the resources for masculinities theories, then we have to admit that fundamentally it were the feminist theories on patriarchy and black feminism. Feminist theories on patriarchy and the related debates over the role of men in transforming patriarchy had acted as primary resources for this research. At the same time, women of color, for example, Maxine Bakazin, Angela Davis and Bell Hooks particularly, had criticized the race bias that occurs when power is solely conceptualized in terms of sexual differences. Thus, laying the groundwork for questioning any universalizing claims about the category of men. The Gramscian term hegemony was also used to understand the stabilization of class relations and control. Employment of the idea of hegemony deconstructs the issue of control and power while contextualizing the role of men and masculinities in the discourse of gender and sexualities studies. Gramsci's writings focus on the dynamics of structural inconsistencies, hierarchies and issues of historical change. Connell and Mesher Schmidt thus note that the idea of hegemony is more than a simple model of cultural control. They review the critical sex role theory and its limiting conceptual basis which had not included the experiences of homosexual men. So, the question we face is how to define the role of a male in the society. Researchers prove that even before the women's liberation movement, a literature in social psychology and sociology about the male sex role had recognized the social nature of masculinity and the possibilities of change in men's conduct. During the 1970s, there was an explosion of writing uh, 
about the male role, sharply criticizing role norms as a source of oppressive behavior by men. Critical role theory provided the main conceptual basis for the blurring of behavior, norm and role of men in society. However, the sex role theory was still limiting in its conceptual basis. Connell and Mesher Schmidt observe and also prove that gender development is a deep complex process. It is influenced by a plurality of discourses and continues to do so. The category of men is not a homogeneous one. Along with these influences and also the fact that the role concept had not included the homosexual men's experiences. The concept was also deeply influenced by psychoanalysis and pop psychology. We can refer to Sigmund Freud who had produced the first analytic biographies of men. The Wolf Men which was written by him at the end of 1914 but could not be published until 1918. The Wolfman was based on the interpretation of dreams of one of his patients, Sergei Pankev. This gender development is a deep complex theorization. It is influenced by a plurality of discourse and also continues to do so. For example, the psychoanalyst Robert Stoller, whom we have referred to earlier also, popularized the concept of gender identity and mapped its variations in boys development, most famously those leading to transsexualism. So, this essay provides formulation and the application of the concept of hegemonic masculinity. It is a normative practice and it allows men's dominance over women, sometimes supported by violence both ideologically and physically. According to Connell and Messerschmitt, it was in the late 1980s and early 1990s that the concept of hegemonic masculinity was formulated and consolidated as an academic field. Hegemonic masculinity is understood as a pattern of practice. That means things done, not just a set of role expectations or an identity. And it allowed men's dominance over women to continue. The description of the concept, however, is not static. Hegemonic masculinity was not assumed to be normal in the statistical sense. Only a minority of men might enact it, but it was certainly normative. For example, it embodied the currently most honored way of being a man, and it also required all other men to position themselves in relation to it. In theory and practice, the concept ideologically legitimated the global subordination of women to men. And men who received the benefits of patriarchy without enacting a strong version of masculine dominance could be regarded as showing a complicit masculinity. It was in relation to this group and to compliance among heterosexual women that the concept of hegemony was most powerful. Hegemony did not mean violence, but it could be supported by force. However, it definitely meant an ascendancy which had been achieved through culture, institutions and persuasion. The concept is also descriptive. It is defined in terms of the logic of a patriarchal gender system. Men assumed that gender relations were historical. So, gender hierarchies were subject to change as we have discussed in the context of feminist theories also. But these gender relations according to masculinities studies changed only in accordance with the male desire and fantasies. Hegemonic masculinities therefore came into existence in specific circumstances and were open to historical change. Connell and Mesher Schmidt suggest that the concept of hegemonic masculinity formulated in the mentioned terms found prompt use. It was used firstly to develop gender neutral pedagogy 
Secondly, to understand the socio-cultural process of being or becoming a man and thirdly, to responding to the heterosexual image of the ideal man which has been popularized by the mainstream culture. It has also provided adequate and dynamic practical approaches to the issues faced by men in contemporary times. For example, explicit risk taking behavior in men or participation of men in child care or violence against the elderly women, children and other men. The concepts of hegemonic and subordinated masculinities helped in understanding not only men's exposure to risk, but also men's difficulties in responding to disability and injury, show emotions, react and accept. Yet other mechanisms of hegemony operate by invisibility. For example, removing a dominant form of masculinity from the possibility of censure and criticism. From the mid 1980s to the early 2000s, the concept of hegemonic masculinity thus passed from a conceptual model with narrow empirical base to a widely used framework for research and debate. The concept was applied in cultural as well as in practical contexts. Critics like Martino, Sebo and Gordon have referred to the fact that the concept of hegemonic masculinity was used in education studies to understand the dynamics of classroom life, including patterns of resistance and bullying among boys. It was also used to explore relations to the curriculum and the difficulties in gender neutral pedagogy. At the same time, the social determinants of men's health allowed the readers to understand the difficulty faced by several men to express issues regarding mental health. The concepts of multiple masculinities and hegemonic masculinity were increasingly used to understand the health practices among men such as playing hurt and risk taking sexual behavior. These concepts also helped us in understanding men's difficulties in responding to emotions, to disability and injury etc. So this concept of hegemonic masculinity has become a pedagogical and empirical framework to understand, theorize, research and debate about men and masculinities from the mid 1980s to the early 2000s. The concept has been applied in diverse cultural context and to a considerable range of practical issues. A hierarchy of masculinities constructed within gender relations cannot logically be continuous with the patriarchal subordination of women. It is also argued that hegemonic masculinity constructs masculine power from the direct experience of women rather than from the structural basis of women's subordination. This argument has been put forward by Oystein Halter. He believes that we must distinguish between patriarchy and gender. Patriarchy that is the long term structure of the subordination of women and gender which is a specific system of exchange that arose in the context of modern capitalism. We must also factor in the institutionalization of gender inequalities, the role of cultural constructions and the interplay of gender dynamics with race, class and region. So, research on men and masculinities according to Connell and Messier Smith shows that the concept of hegemonic masculinity is not trapped in reification. As a concept, it remains abstract, not a monolithic or concrete entity. Other researches, especially studies of school classrooms show the production and negotiation of masculinities and also femininities as configurations of practice and performance. Connell and Mesher also refer to Collier's definition of hegemonic masculinity 
associated with criminology. In order to depict the plurality of crisis within the discourse of masculinities and men's studies. Collier has criticized the concept of hegemonic masculinity through its typical use in accounting for violence and crime. In the masculinity turn, quote unquote, in criminology, Collier suggests that hegemonic masculinity came to be associated solely with negative characteristics that depict men as unemotional, independent, non-nurturing, aggressive and dispassionate which are seen as the causes of criminal behavior. This can be seen in many discussions of men's health and problems of boys education as the contemporary troubles assembled under the banner of a crisis in masculinity. However, the crisis in masculinities is not just restricted to aggressive behavior and violence portrayed by men. We need to redefine the alpha centric definition of the man and should not limit the discourse to heteronormative subjectivities only. In pop psychology, the invention of new character types such as the alpha male, the sensitive new age guy, the hairy man, the new lad, the red boy etc suggests that hegemonic masculinity is not a singularity. So, hegemonic masculinity can become a scientific sounding synonym for a type of rigid domineering sexist macho men. Hegemonic masculinity sometimes refers to men's engaging in toxic practices including physical violence that stabilize gender dominance in a particular setting. However, violence and other noxious practices are not always the defining characteristics since hegemony has numerous configurations. Subjects such as health, education, fashion, social media footprints and many more are included in understanding the range of popular ideologies which constitute the image of the ideal desired man. The authors note that being a man is a process in becoming and not a static conceptualization. Cornell points out that the concept of hegemony would be or not be relevant if the only characteristics of the dominant group that is men were violence, aggression and self-centeredness. Collier observes that what actually is being discussed in many accounts of hegemonic masculinity and crime and we may add health and education also is a range of popular ideologies of what constitute ideal or actual characteristics of being a man. The concept of hegemonic masculinity is not a catch all nor a prime cause, it is a means of grasping a certain dynamic within the social process. While presenting the various approaches taken up by Halter and Collier, Connell and Mesher Schmidt established the multiple accounts of the concept of hegemonic masculinity. In considering such diverse theorizations, they suggest five principal criticisms for the underlying concept of hegemonic masculinity. Connell and Mesher Schmidt feel that these five principal criticisms have advanced since the early 1990s and they review this criticism to discover what is worth retaining from the original conception of hegemonic masculinity and what now needs reformulating. The underlying concept of masculinity is abstract, it is flawed and is framed within the heteronormative conception of gender. Sex versus gender dichotomy marginalizes body, masculinity is a dynamic entity and it has marginalized the homosexual men. The underlying concept of masculinity is flawed from the point of view of realist and also post structuralist criticism. The concept of masculinity is blurred, is uncertain in its meaning and tends to de-emphasize issues of power and domination. Secondly, it is flawed because it essentializes the character of men 
or imposes a false unity on a fluid and contradictory reality. The concept of masculinity is criticized for being framed within a heteronormative conception of gender that essentializes male female difference and ignores difference and exclusion within the gender categories. There is a tendency in the men's studies field to presume separate spheres to proceed as if women were not a relevant part of the analysis and therefore to analyze masculinities by looking only at men and relations among men is inherently faulty. The cure lies in taking a consistently relational approach to gender. In one of his earlier articles, Cornell had also commented that the notion that the concept of masculinity essentializes or homogenizes is quite difficult to reconcile with the tremendous multiplicity of social constructions that ethnographers and historians have documented with the aid of this concept. Connell and Mesher Smith suggest that the masculine subject, masculinity and the masculine are embedded in the socio-normative understanding of these terms. However, their genealogy is relevant to understand the changed nature and understanding of the masculine in the men's and masculinities studies. Therefore, the concept of hegemonic masculinity requires new formulations within a multidimensional understanding of gender. As they have suggested, masculinity is not a fixed entity embedded in the body or personality traits of individuals. Masculinities are configurations of practice that are accomplished in social action and therefore can differ according to the gender relations in a particular social setting. In the development of the concept of hegemonic masculinity, divisions among men, especially the exclusion and subordination of homosexual men were quite central issues. Hegemonic masculinity cannot be understood as the settled character structure of any group of men. Men can dodge among multiple meanings according to their interactional needs. They can adopt hegemonic masculinity when it is desirable, but the same men can distance themselves strategically from hegemonic masculinity at other moments. Consequently, masculinity represents not a certain type of man, but rather a way that men position themselves through discursive practices. According to this view, the model of hegemonic masculinity presumes a unitary subject, but depth psychology reveals a multi-layered or divided subject. Depth psychology is a science of the unconscious covering both psychoanalysis and psychology. It explores the relationship between the conscious and the unconscious as well as the patterns and dynamics of motivation and the mind. So, depth psychology has revealed a multi-layered subject. Jefferson criticizes the over socialized view of the male subject in studies of masculinity which has resulted in a lack of attention to how men actually relate psychologically to hegemonic masculinity. The next question that is central to Cornell and Mesher Smith's understanding of hegemonic masculinity is what constitutes gender relations. Since men as discursive subjects are quite similar to women with their individual subjectivities and the situatedness, gender relations are constituted or produced through non-discursive practices and unreflective routinized actions such as sexual orientation, participation in child care and household chores. So, they ask what constitutes gender relations? Gender relations are constituted through non-discursive practices. Recognizing the non-discursive and unreflective dimensions of gender gives us some sense of the limits to discursive flexibility. 
The possibilities are constrained massively by embodiment, by institutional histories, by economic forces and by personal and family relationships. Men as discursive subjects are not unitary, unified subjects. An individual's approach towards masculinity can be better understood by their respective life choices, life history and routinized narratives formulated through gender formation. So, Connell and Messerschmitt suggest that approaches such as Sartre's existential psychoanalysis are helpful for understanding masculinities as projects and a masculine identity as always being a provisional accomplishment within a life course. Connell comments and I quote, masculinity is defined as a configuration of practice organized in relation to the structure of gender relations. Human social practice creates gender relations in history. So, Connell has commented that the concept of hegemonic masculinity is embedded in a historically dynamic view of gender and therefore, the subject itself cannot be erased and therefore, a study of the life histories has become significant for us. According to the authors, gender relations, systematic subordination of women and various exclusion practices conducted to marginalize the other are crucial in understanding the patterns of surveillance, control and dominance. In social theories of gender, gender relations are considered as self-constrained, self-reproducing systems and explaining every element in terms of its function in reproducing the whole. In considering gender relations, the dominance of men and the subordination of women constitute a historical process, not a self-reproducing system. To sustain a given pattern of hegemony requires the policing of men as well as the exclusion or discrediting of women and therefore, producing patterns of control. Connell and Messerschmitt also refer to Demetrius. Demetrius has proposed two formats of masculinity, internal masculinity and external masculinity. It suggests that there is a plurality of discourses within the discourse of masculinity and men's studies. External hegemony in his opinion refers to the institutionalization of men's dominance over women. Internal hegemony on the other hand refers to the social ascendancy of one group of men over all other men. This conceptualization presents an exchange between the two types as a historical process which is changing rapidly in our contemporary times where many masculine practices are submerged into other masculinities in turn creating cultural hybrids. For example, cisgender men wearing makeup. Dimitri argues that the relationship between the two forms is unclear in the original formulation of the concept and unspecified in current usage. Moreover, subordinate and marginalized masculinities have no impact on the construction of hegemonic masculinity. Non-hegemonic masculinities exist in tension with but never penetrate or impact the hegemonic masculinity. Moreover, subordinate and marginalized masculinities have no impact on the construction of hegemonic masculinity. Non-hegemonic masculinities exist in tension with the hegemonic masculinity, but never penetrate or impact it. There is then a dualistic representation of masculinities. It misses the dialectical pragmatism of internal hegemony by which hegemonic masculinity appropriates from other masculinities whatever appears to be pragmatically useful for continued domination. The result of this dialectic is not a unitary pattern of hegemonic masculinity, but a historic block involving a weaving together of multiple patterns whose hybridity is the best possible strategy for external hegemony. A constant process of negotiation, translation 
and reconfiguration occurs. This conceptualization leads to a different view of historical change in masculinities. Hegemonic masculinity is not always singular, rather the hegemonic masculinity block is a hybridization whose appropriation of diverse elements makes it capable of reconfiguring itself and adapting to the specificities of new historical conjectures. As some critics have suggested, there are a thousand and one variations of masculinities. At this moment, I would refer to a brief talk by Professor Cornell, who sums up the crisis in masculinities. Well, for me, masculinity is a pattern of practice. Um, so it's not an attitude, it's not what's in people's heads, it's not the state of their hormones, it's what they actually do in the world. And um, that's something that um, has a relationship to your body, to your biology, but not a fixed relationship. So women can behave in a masculine way, though usually it's men who do. And also there are different patterns of masculinity. So different groups of men will conduct themselves in different ways. And those patterns also can change over time. Um, and that, of course, is what we hope to achieve in anti-violence work, uh, because some patterns of masculinity do include um, a willingness to use violence, an openness to use violence, whereas other patterns of masculinity are, uh, in, in comparison, peaceable. Um, and part of the problem of reducing violence in the world is to shift from the first to the second kind of masculinity. Masculinities do, I mean, centrally concern relations between men as a group and women as a group, and of course individual relationships between particular men and particular women. But <clears throat> they also concern relationships among men, um, so that one of the things research uh, has repeatedly shown in, in different parts of the world is a kind of hierarchy among masculinities where in a given community or a given organization, one kind of masculinity is the honored one, is the top dog, so to speak, the hegemonic pattern of masculinity. And other forms of masculinity, by contrast, are less honored, more marginalized, um, perhaps even excluded from respect altogether. Um, there are <coughs> really quite a range of things that can be done um, among different groups of men and boys, of course, because boys, um, many of them in school, uh, many of them in learning situations of one kind or another, are actually in the process of forming their patterns of masculinity. Uh, so interventions towards more peaceable forms of masculinity should, I think, definitely include boys as well as adult men. Um, these interventions can take the form of um, some personalised situations where uh, you create a safe space for boys or men to talk about gender relations, talk about their experiences with women, talk about their experiences with other men and think through what it would be to live in a more peaceable, more democratic kind of way. Um, there are also public policy interventions which might um, uh, create the possibilities of change in masculinity, uh, given that uh, the most violent institutions in the world are states, military, prison systems, police forces. How can we reduce the impact? of that kind of organised violence is also part of the problem of, uh, of uh, changing masculinities. So today we have established the dynamic nature and the potentiality of the masculine subject, masculinities and men's studies in the context of the approach taken by Connell and Messerschmitt. The next module will present the various reformulations suggested by these authors to reform, revisit
and reassess the concept of hegemonic masculinities and present a more contemporary approach to men and men's studies. Thank you.